So, what's up everybody? Thanks for clicking this video. Thanks for tuning into my channel. My name is Simon Hill, Black American from Louisiana, coming to you live from Budapest, Hungary, and I'm here with my beautiful wife. Say hi, boo. Hi everyone, I'm Akti, and yeah, I'm from Turkey. And today we are reviewing the 2023 film, 2024. Not exactly sure. I'm going to list it as 2024 because that's when we saw it. Why not? Fuck it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the film is called Lost Souls. It debuted at Tribeca last year and it's been bubbling underground. And this was a movie that Akti recommended. Akti, how did you find this film? I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. Probably saw it like on a movie list of something. Yeah. I'm not sure, but it might be on Letterbox. I see. I see. And uh, I got to say, we watched it last night. And since we've watched it, I can't stop thinking about it because this film hits really, really close home to me because this is a film about struggle rappers in like the modern day. Now, this is a Gen Z film, so, like, everybody in this film definitely was born, like, after 2005. Like, nobody has a birthday before 2004 in this film, from how they look, how they act, and the aesthetic and everything. But it is still very close to my generation, and uh, I love hip-hop, and uh, I grew up loving hip-hop. I used to be a rapper, and seeing all of this on camera, like, really brought me back to me being 16, 17, having all these hopes and dreams, and also made me cringe at sometimes too, like at, you know, some of the things that they were going through and some of the things they were saying and how they were acting and everything. I don't know, man. I just really, really like this film. I know it might sound like I hype up every film we talk about, but this one, this one's different. This, this is a bit different for me. Is but it better than... Feel? Is it better than uh, Divorce in Black? No, it's not better than <laughs> Tyler Perry's Divorce in Black. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not well, at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I also wanted to, like, see this movie when I saw that it was about, like, a, you know, trying to, like, a person trying to become a rapper. And uh, not because, like, I was a rapper before, but I was interested in music a lot, like, in high school and... uh I did have like, you know, trips, like going to concerts, performing at concerts and stuff. So I do like, you know, for me as well, I remember those moments as I was watching it. I wasn't like struggling. I was just in the school band. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, of course, yeah, like I dreamed about it once and stuff like that. And yeah, overall, I just felt like this was such a cozy movie uh, that was also very real. Like it almost felt like... At some points, it almost felt like a documentary. Yeah, yeah. Cozy is a great way to put it because this film doesn't want to challenge you with an overbearing narrative or complex relations between the characters. It's really about the feeling. So I could understand also if some people really don't like this film. And this might be polarizing for some people, but this film is about the vibes, like capital V, vibes. Like you either feel it or you don't. And, um, yeah, it's, it really does touch is, it really does touch you though, if you are very close to those feelings that you had when you were a teen, when you were, uh, a person, uh, coming up in this world and you're lost and confused and you don't know which way to go. So that's what I think. Yeah. Vibes with a Z. Vibes <laughs> with a capital V ending with a Z. Yeah. <laughs> like, I like this, I like this film for the same reason I like some Juice World songs, like some, XXX Tentacion songs, some, you know, Lil Uzi Vert songs, right? They're not overly complex. They're not overly bearing. It's based on the melody. It's based on the, the feeling it evokes more than like classic hip hop, like Nas, Jay-Z, Tupac, where it's heavily based on narrative, heavily, heavily based on lyrics, heavily based on skill level, right? This is more based on that that emotion that it can evoke, if that makes sense. You feel me? Yeah, definitely. And, like, you know, you don't have to be, like, related to music to like this movie, I think, because it does also portray, like, a lot of those feelings that you feel when you were young. Uh, just, like, doing, you know, crazy stuff, not really thinking about your consequences of your actions. And, uh, yeah, like, just enjoying the moment, and also, like, having regrets. 
mm-hmm. as well as a as a young person as a teenager. Yeah. So I think like on that level as well, music is a big part of this movie. And uh and I also really liked that we got to see like the creative process of it as well. Mm-hmm. But you don't need to be interested in music to like like this movie and watch it and and ha- have those feelings. Yeah, but I think it would help if you do. I think if you're watching this film and you're not like a music person, which I find very strange, like who doesn't like music if not love music? Everybody has a favorite song, favorite artist, favorite album at least. You know what I mean? You either have one of those three, I would say. But if you are a hip hop head or a hip hop fan and you appreciate what the next generation is doing with the genre, this film is even more interesting, I would say. Would you agree or disagree? Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I guess like, yeah, like you said, what I meant was maybe you're not interested in hip hop or rap or R&B. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can still like, I would say you can still enjoy this movie yeah. a lot. Yeah, if I had to describe what this film is for somebody who doesn't know, this is a cross of like Hustle and Flow, the 2005 film with Terrence Howard. Have you seen it? Um, no, no, I oh, haven't. Oh, that's that's what we got to do. We got to go like on a hip hop movie like binge because there's so many <laughs> great hip hop films. But this is a mix of the 2005 Hustle and Flow film by Terrence Howard and the 1995 indie drama cult classic Kids. So imagine you mesh those two films together and you sort of get this weird baby. That's the, that's the best way I can describe this film. And, uh, yeah, any other sort of like coming of age story. But this isn't like a traditional coming of age story where like somebody like learns and grows, uh, as they enter this new stage of their life. This is actually sort of like a stuck in age story, if that makes sense. Like, I would argue that this film is about not having the ability to grow to some degree and being sort of like, personally stunted in your development would you agree or disagree what do you think Mm, i don't know if i would agree to that but maybe in a sense that like for me i think this is a coming of age movie with like showing that you know the newer generation um is like sort of being how can i say this okay the newer generation is sort of being pursued to you know, persuaded. have these crazy dreams and... Do you mean persuaded? Yeah, like, they're being persuaded by the society, I think, uh, that they should have crazy dreams, that they can do whatever they want, and uh, all they should do is, like, hustle and hustle, and then they can get it through, like, social media, through, you know, just trying and grinding. And I think, like... That's why a lot of like, there are so many artists coming from this generation because everybody's trying to make it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's a coming of age story combined with that pressure. I get what you're saying. I, of course, like, you know, in this film, everybody's trying to be a rapper, right? And if we break down what being a rapper is, it's almost like you're the spokesperson for modern capitalism because rappers, most of them rap about, you know, drugs, money, cars, clothes, hoes. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah, you're advertising all of the things in our society that are the most materialistic. But I I would say this film doesn't even really touch that nerve uh, that much. It doesn't talk about the contradictions of, like, following your dreams to be basically a walking billboard for every brand or the spokesperson for every brand. It doesn't touch that. So I don't I don't know if I can get with that uh, part of it. Right. But I do think there is something that you're saying there about following your dreams and how your dreams can sort of uh, crush you, right? Or the pursuit of them can crush you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, not not like the, you know, financial or political side of being a rapper. Not that part. But just basically more like you want to do something and you go after that, like as a passion. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's music and, you know, rapping and singing. So, yeah. 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 Well, speaking of rapping and singing, another thing that I found really interesting after we watched this film, I was like, who are the people on, on screen? Because none of them are uh, familiar to me. So I looked up the cast and basically everybody in this thing really is a struggle rapper. 
Like the main character, his name is Sol. He's played by this guy called Suave Seidel. Suave Seidel. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. But he is actually a struggle rapper with like 5,000 subscribers on YouTube and maybe 20,000 followers on Instagram, something like that. I don't know. I don't use Instagram. But yeah, like everybody here basically is still really on the grind trying to come up in the music business. From from Nina, uh, who's really crystal popping, the Mexican rapper out of Texas, to uh, Bronski, who plays Mao, one of the other rappers Soul is running with in the van, to even his best friend, Wesley, in the film. He's actually a struggle rapper, too, called Young Bambi. And I'm like, wow, like, that's why this film feels so different. It feels so real. Like, what did you think about that when we discovered that everybody here is basically really who they are on screen? Yeah, so when I looked up this movie, uh, I, from the description, uh, I remembered or I thought that this was like a documentary, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I saw the movie, I'm like, okay, this is not a documentary, but it does feel like super authentic. So I was thinking also like, you know, maybe it is real to an extent. And yeah, like also after watching the movie, seeing all the actors and how they are still struggling mm -hmm. as, you know, rappers or singers, et cetera. It just, yeah, it brings like a different sense of authenticity, like very honesty, like very mm -hmm. honest type of movie. Mm -hmm. And uh I do also have to say, like, honestly, I like everyone better in the movie <laughs> than in real life. Sorry, guys. Like, I... I think you're doing great and you should follow your dreams, but you know. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I disagree. I, we listened to basically everybody's music before we turned on this. And some of them actually do got something. Like I feel like, uh, Crystal Poppin, the girl who plays Nina in this film, she got some heat. Bransky is hella talented in the film, but it seems like he stopped making music six years ago. I can't find anything on him on YouTube, but maybe if he got back in the booth, it'd be fire. Suave is okay. I think he's improving. Young Bambi is like on some drill-ish, right? Like Wesley, the guy who plays Wesley is like now becoming like a drill gangster turn up rapper. But there's some talent there. And Seven as well. Seven has, you know, he has some, uh, he has something. He has something he's working with as well. So yeah, I think all of them have their talents. And also you liked Micro TDH, right? The, the Venezuelan guy, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm no I mean I'm not saying they're not talented. Mm -hmm. Like they are talented. It's just that I think the movie sort of like, you know, bonds the audience with them through their friendship a little mm -hmm. bit and like through their conversations and their creative process. Mm -hmm. So just seeing that made me really like love them on the screen. Mm -hmm. And then like seeing them separately, it was like, you know, oh, just another like trying to be trying to be successful person right. on the screen. But yeah, they're definitely like very talented ones. I really liked Micro's like song, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, they all got talents and I wish the best for all of them. And hopefully this film can break through uh, their music and whatever else they're working on. And by the way, you don't have to mute all the time. Let's make this more authentic. Like you don't have to mute. I don't know. Why are you muting? Uh, well, because when I didn't mute, you were like, I can hear different sounds. Anyway, so, so yeah, I hope, uh, all of them get the opportunity to like blow up. And, uh, it's crazy because like when we're going on their YouTubes and stuff, like it seems like they're still hella accessible. Like I'm posting on my struggle YouTube channel and some of them I have more subscribers than <laughs> some of my videos get more views than their like new music videos, which is, which is crazy to think about, but it's, uh, I think this film will grow in popularity over time and become a cult classic, though. What do you think? I think so. I think this movie is definitely underrated mm -hmm. uh, because it's not like a big film, you know, like by big brands. Uh, but definitely, I think all of them were really good actors, even though like, you know, when I watched the interviews and stuff, it did look like they were acting like themselves, like 80% of the time or 70% of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also why it was very natural. But I do definitely think like this movie can open up their careers, hopefully. 
Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it can. But yeah, let's walk through the story. The story is kind of really simple. I mean, you can summarize it in 30 minutes or maybe even less, 30 seconds, actually. But let's walk through it because I think the first few scenes are worth discussing and breaking down. So the movie opens with this guy who looks like uh, Travis Scott. He looks like Juice World. He looks like Lil Uzi Vert. Like, think of the worst uh, struggle rapper on SoundCloud you can think of, like Little Molly, <laughs> Little Zan, <laughs> Little Percocet, whatever. He has, like, colored dreads, and, and he's sitting in the mirror in his bathroom uh, talking to himself, saying, like, you're going to blow up. You're a superstar. You're going to be successful. Then he opens up Instagram, and he's got a bunch of people in his live stream chat, like, sending fire and heart emojis, and he's saying, I appreciate you all as fans. And then he goes to, like, a music video set, and he's, you know, rapping in front of the camera, uh, and while there are break dancers behind him and stuff like that, then the um, then the music cuts. And this guy comes up and says, that's my bro. And that's Wesley. Wesley is like the guy who is like his manager and he's supporting him, helping him grow in his career. And then after they shoot this music video in front of this fancy car with all the lights and, and dancers and stuff, him, Wesley, and uh, Wesley's little sister uh, are sitting at the bus stop. And the main character, Soul, is asking uh, Wesley, hey, where'd you get that car? And uh, Wesley's like, don't worry about it. And then he's like, nah, did you, did you pay for it? Did you rent it? And Wesley's like, don't worry about it. I rented it and all that. They go back to Wesley's house and, uh, basically Soul has been living with Wesley and Wesley's mother because, you know, his family, I guess, is not taking care of him and stuff like that. What did you think about like the opening scenes there? Yeah, it was definitely once again, very authentic. Like, it looked like this could be a real story. It felt, like, documentary-ish because they were also showing, like, these phone footages at the same time, like, you know, the vertical ones. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it definitely was feeling, like, real. And also just seeing, you know, these two guys, they they obviously don't have, like, all the opportunity in the world, but they're still friends and they're still trying to, like, make something and... You know, obviously, it also reminded me of my best friend and how we would talk about, like, what we're going to do mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it was it was like a nice start to it. What yeah. did you think? Yeah, like you said, I didn't know anything about this movie. So from the very first scene, it looks like a documentary because the camera is like not a steady cam. The and the way he's talking and looking at his Instagram and all that sort of stuff, it felt like. Like at any moment, there was going to be like a cutaway scene where they like sit down, uh, soul and say, tell us how you're feeling. And he's like, man, I'm just on the grind, bro. Like something like that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it felt really, really real. And I, one thing that I was going to say is like, I thought in this movie, they were going to do much more background on the characters, but it's like, for this type of movie and story, we already know what it's going to be. Like, you don't have to delve so far into Soul's background to know what it is. Like Drake said, boo-hoo, sad story, black American sad dad story, right? Like, probably Soul comes from a broken home. He's living in the hood, and he's just trying to make it as a rapper. Like, you don't even have to say it for it, for us to understand it because it's so close. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And, like, same for Wesley, right? Because... We see, like, his house, and it's not like he's living in a mansion. He's not right. rich either, but right. he just, like, has his mom and his little sister. And they do feel like a little family, like, all together. And it feels like the mom accepted soul in the family as well. Yeah, yeah. But I got to say this, though. <laughs> I got to say this, because this is going to count later in the film. I think Wesley was a badass kid. Like, <laughs> in the entire film, he was pretty bad. Like, because Soul and Wesley go back to the house. Wesley opens up his stash spot that he keeps in the shoebox. And he's got, like, money in there. He's got drugs. He's got everything. And then later on, they go to a party uh, at a house somewhere. And Wesley's like, man, I got to sell these drugs. And Soul is like, man, we came here to stay focused or something like that. And, uh, yeah, they go into the house and Wesley's trying to sell drugs to some white boys, but Soul has to come in there and try to convince the white boy to actually buy him. And, uh, yeah, Wesley was just like a badass kid, I think, man. He was on some gangster shit. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, but it's like at the same time when they were going to the party on the way, they were at the car and he was like, I made this beat, like, 
for us. Don't worry, we're gonna get you some studio time if we can like sell all these drugs. <laughs> so like definitely like he was trying to you know make a future for him and for Seoul. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like he was selling drugs and shooting up people and you know like not doing really anything mm -hmm. with it. He was doing it just to get out of the of, of the place that he was in. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that beat will be important later for the story in this film. But uh yeah, the thing is, and I feel like if you watch this film as a hip hop head, you'll notice this, right? The beat that Wesley made was more of a traditional boom bap, East Coast, jazzy instrumental, right? But when we listen to Soul's music throughout the film, it's this new age, very synthy, syncopated, uh synthetic 150, 180 beats per minute type track, right? So I was thinking when Wesley played that track, and this movie doesn't go in this direction, but I was just thinking this, that Soul was going to be like, man, that shit garbage. That's whack. That's that old school shit. You get what I'm saying? But then Wesley was like, nah, nah, it's a hit and stuff like that. But Soul actually said he liked the beat, too. And they actually used the beat later, right, in this film. And, uh, yeah, that, that's something that you'll just notice if you're a hip-hop head watching this film and thinking about how unique this this movie captures this transition from, like, what hip hop has been to what it's becoming, right? And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, any comments about the music? Uh, I mean, yeah, like I realized the difference between what like Soul uh, was singing and then what uh, Wesley showed him. I didn't mm -hmm. like know the you know the details of it, obviously, but it was just like yeah, it's a different vibe. Yeah, basically, yeah. and uh, yeah, I mean, I think. Soul was like, oh, it's okay. Like, it's a, it's a good beat. Mm -hmm. Like, he wasn't that impressed with it. And, uh, it also almost felt like, you know, he was just in his head and he just wanted to do his own thing a little bit, but he loved his friend as well. Yeah. And that was like the vibe I got from that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And they do, sh they do show like they have like a real sincere brotherly bond. You know, it feels authentic and real. And, um, yeah, uh, speaking of the music though, like, uh, when they make it to the house party, there's some music playing in the background, and it's actually the music of one of the characters here, whose name is Seven. And in real life, he's a actor by the name of Aaron, right? And, uh, he's the white boy, young white boy, right? Aaron Malou, he plays Seven. And, uh, the song is called Beyonce. And as soon as I heard it, I said, that's a hit. That's low key a hit, low key. <laughs> the soundtrack to this film is gonna be fire, but I'm mad it's not on SoundCloud. And, uh, yeah, Soul goes on stage to perform at this house party, and he does, uh, one of his songs, which is actually kinda cool. The song is like very emotional and moody, and it talks about, you know, wanting to be a star and not giving up on your dreams and stuff like that. And the crowd likes it and rocks with it. And, uh, there's this girl looking at him while he's performing, and she talks to Wesley and she says, uh, hey, he's pretty good, right? And uh, that girl looking at him is Nina, who is sort of like the manager for the group that goes up after Soul on stage called LIA, which is like this big posse group uh, with like four guys. And they, you know, basically rip the stage up and uh, do like a more hype, hype, crunk song for the crowd. Uh, what did you think of those two performances, if anything? Uh, I really liked, you know, they, that they did different types of, like, different vibes of songs. Uh, that was definitely, like, refreshing. And I think, like, the songs you hear throughout the movie make so much sense as you're watching the movie and you actually do vibe to them. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if I would listen to each song, like, if I, if I just, like, heard, you know, those songs on a Spotify list, maybe I might skip them. Mm -hmm. And not like add them to my playlist or something. But as you're watching the movie, it makes a lot of sense and it makes you want to listen to it more. It makes you want to add it to your playlist. Definitely yeah. because it's like capturing those moments. And I definitely like when I saw like that posse up on the stage, mm -hmm. I remembered your videos that mm -hmm. you showed me from like when you were in university and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. How what did I you feel? Yeah, what I think is uh interesting about this film and the music that it's focused on, right? It's focused on this very particular type of rap, you know, SoundCloud, what some people call mumble rap, 
emo, emotional singing rap. And if you really think about it, it's hard to even classify this as hip hop, right? Because the melodies they're hitting, the way they're flowing, the lack of actual 16 bar song structure that we're used to in hip hop. That's not what these guys are doing, right? And I think when you pair this music with the story that this film is telling, it makes you respect SoundCloud rap, mumble rap, whatever you want to call it, a bit more, right? Because like you said, Acti, you would hear these songs on SoundCloud and maybe skip them, right? Because a lot of the music is like kind of disposable and almost easily replicable by other people, right? But I do think the best of this type of music has a specific feeling to it that even the even the greatest of old school classic hip hop can't replicate. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does definitely feel like, you know, like what you described, this new age of hip hop. Right. Where you have this sort of like sentimental slash indie slash emo, you know, sound. Right. And like you said, I see, I hear these type of songs like all the time on my Spotify weekly discovery list. Mm-hmm. And I just skip them mm-hmm. most of the time. But hearing it here was dope. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, like, I have SoundCloud, so, like, I get that type of stuff in my recommendations all the time. And sometimes I really listen to them, and I really like them. Like, there's this guy out of L.A. called Lambo Foe, and he looks just like Soul Sidel, like, Soul, the main character here. And he makes similar music, very emotional, evocative, like, like in this film like these guys are hitting these sort of melodies that really like touch you low key but is this hip hop is this hip hop like acting I think that's one of the big questions because I might call this a hip hop film and some old heads might say no this ain't hip hop this ain't hip hop the hibbity hibbity wow I mean is this hip hop what do you think I think it is because I think hip hop has evolved so much and has so many like sub genres under it, uh, sub genres up after un- under it. So it's like, for me, it is hip hop, but it's just like a different form of it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like I also agree with you. Sometimes, you know, those artists I hear on Spotify, for example, some of them like hit. Mm-hmm. And some of them, I'm like, wow, like this guy has a beautiful voice or th- these lyrics are so nice. Mm-hmm. But then I never really get to hear another album from them or another song from them because, yeah, yeah they don't just, they don't become popular. Right, right, right. Exactly. Like there's so many of these type of rappers. Like it is sort of flooded, right? The market is so flooded with SoundCloud rappers, YouTube rappers, everybody's trying to pop on TikTok and stuff like that. It's hard to make anything go nowadays. And yeah, when everybody has the same look and aesthetic, the colored dreads, the tattoos on the face, piercings all over their bodies, it's hard to say, okay, what makes you distinct from the next guy, right? So, but but I don't know, the kids like it. A part of me also doesn't want to hate on this film though. And And tell me if I'm wrong. Because I don't want to seem old and out of touch. I don't want to be like how my parents were or other generations were with their kids' music. Because they looked at what we were listening to and said, that's trash, that's garbage, that's crass. And a part of me is also like loving this film because it's like me trying to be open-minded to what, you know, Gen Z is doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think, you know, old hip-hop heads should also have that mentality because... The struggles or like how we express those struggles are changing from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And like this generation are, is in more in tune with their feelings Mm -hmm. and is more emotional and maybe more comfortable just expressing them in vulnerable ways. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like the generation before that, they still express their emotions and feelings, but maybe it was in the form of like, like very fast, more violent rap, for example. Yeah. That still expresses some feeling, right? Or mm-hmm. some experience. And, you know, this is how the new generation ex- is expressing what they are feeling and what right. they are going through. So. Right, right, right. Like this film and the music in it, and everybody's probably listening right now and thinking, why are they just sitting here talking about hip hop and stuff like that? I think this is very important because this film, you know, is really showcasing something that I don't think other 
hip hop films have shown to this degree, which is the transition of the genre from one thing to the next, which goes understated, but it's noticed by somebody who is a hip hop fan. And secondly, how so many things sort of stay the same from generation to generation, right? Uh, like the, like, Soul is a black man in America who feels alienated around the world, who feels alienated in his world, right? Because of his missing father, right? He has to live with his best friend's mother, right? He comes from a broken home, right? Boo hoo, sad story, black American dad story, right? But so, but so much has changed since then, right? And, uh, since we were telling our stories, like the millennials, we were telling our, our, our sad stories and the Gen X were telling their sad stories. There wasn't the Jay Z's, Little Wayne's and Nas's that showed you can take your sad story and make it into a billion dollar empire. And that's sort of like what, what, um, Soul is living in, right? He's living in the post hip hop glory days when so many black men in situations like him that seemed hopeless found a way to make it out. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And also like adding on to that, when you have so many great role models that you can look up to, mm -hmm. I think like it, it's very intimidating to do the same style that they're doing and then be better, uh, be better like yeah. from them. So maybe it is okay to take a different approach to, you know, hip hop and rap and not really try to replicate the best. Right. Because, like, what DMX did, what Nas did, what Jay did, what Pac did, what Big did, they've already done all the flows, all the lyrics, all the illest shit you could ever say has been said. Like, nothing's going to be sicker than anything Onyx did. Nothing is going to be harder than the Rough Riders in their heyday. Nothing will be as gangster as 50 Cent in his prime. Like, so what can you do? Okay, now we're singing. <laughs> Got a new girl, she look like she Beyonce. <laughs> Might get married to the money, my fiance. Like, okay, we just gotta take it to some other shit. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like just just realizing right now, you know, the old generation rappers, they yeah. were quoting big political figures, big historical figures, right? And then like this generation is quoting big rappers. Mm. So mm -hmm. like you can even see the change from that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh yeah, moving on in the story. Uh basically, so Soul gets off stage and uh Nina is sort of like side-eyeing him while his while her band is performing LIA. And so then later on in the story, right, the police are outside of this uh uh, this house party, right? And Soul runs upstairs to try to find Wesley, and Wesley is like knocked out in the bed. And, um, you know, Soul is trying to wake him up and save him and, and say, come on, we gotta go, we gotta run. But, uh, Wesley is not responding. So Soul like takes Wesley's backpack full of the drugs and tries to run out and escape. Uh, but he's caught by the police. Uh, the, the police sit him out, outside of the house with a, with a bunch of other people. But then Nina comes and says, that guy right there, he's with us. And then the cop says, all right, curly head, you can go. And so, uh, you know, uh, Soul narrowly escapes being caught with all those drugs in that backpack. And so then Soul goes to meet Nina's band, LIA, and there's Mal there, uh, there's, uh, Froggy, uh, there's Seven, and then there's, um, uh, what's his name? Mal. Yeah. Pardon? Mal. Yeah, Mal. I already said that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's Mal, Kai, Froggy, Nina, and Seven, right? These yeah. are the people in the van. And if there's somebody else I'm missing, there was a driver, but who knows who the driver was? Who cares? <laughs> Big Loco. There was Big Loco. Big Loco as well, right? Mm -hmm. So they introduce themselves and they, and they say, yeah, we're on tour in Texas and uh, you should come with us, right? And so then uh, Soul just says, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> and he basically like hops in the van and then he, they drive him to uh, Wesley's house so he can get some of his things. And he sees Wesley's sister there and she's like, where are you going? And he's like, I got to go. And she's like, where's Wesley? And I'm like, he's like, he'll be fine. And so then Soul goes off on a journey with the LIA band to tour across Texas. Right. And uh, basically the rest of the movie or a big chunk of the movie is them you know, traveling 
throughout Texas, going to different places, like stopping randomly at farms where there's a farmer there milking his cow, stopping at like some Prada store in the middle of nowhere to, you know, capture footage and rap and dance in front of it, uh, going on safari to different places at little zoos in the pockets of West Texas, and basically, you know, looking out the window, <laughs> wistfully dreaming of going to L.A. Like, that's basically pretty much the rest of the film for a large part of it. But any comments about anything I said? Yeah. First of all, I was kind of heartbroken when Saul left Wesley like that, because I don't know if it's, this is just girl code, but you never leave like a drunk, passed out person, like friends on their own. Mm -hmm. You never. But I think like before in the movie, when they were talking to Wesley's mom, And then, like, her mom sort of, like, you know, told them, you shouldn't be doing this, like, you should be careful, and this sorts of stuff. And then Soul said to Wesley, like, your mom thinks I'm a bad influence on you. Mm -hmm. So I think that maybe Soul was feeling that pressure, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, his mom was taking care of him, too. Mm -hmm. So maybe he didn't want to be, like, seen with Wesley at that time, because he thought, you know... If I can escape this situation, maybe I can escape that judgment from his mom. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I thought, I mean, that's how I connected it because I was, like, sad that he left mm -hmm. him. And, uh, yeah, like, when he got on the bus and, you know, he met all the people there, I was a bit annoyed by how everyone talks because everyone kept on saying, bruh, you feel me? And, like, all <laughs> this, like, lingo. And I was like, can these people make like good sentences <laughs> and uh, it was a bit annoying but i was just like going through with it you know i'm like it's the vibe it's how these kids talk these days <laughs> mm -hmm. and um yeah and like him deciding to just hop on the van and go with them it's only something you would do if you're young so mm -hmm. i was definitely like relating to you know all those times i hopped on random people's cars And like just went to mm -hmm. different cities and other places and all, all that things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I would say like Saul taking the drugs. I think that was him trying to actually protect Wesley because he was like, if I got the drugs, nobody's going to steal them while he's uh, passed out. And uh, secondly, you know, what if the police find them, find him in this room with a bag of drugs? And uh, yeah, then he's going to be in even more trouble. Right. So he was trying to protect his friend. That's what I think. Uh, I could imagine him feeling guilty that he left his friend to go on tour with these guys. But he was probably like, OK, this is my one shot to get out of Austin, Texas. Uh, these people seem like they got it together. They're doing shows and stuff. So why not rock with them? I'm not going to forget about my homie. I'm just taking this opportunity. So I didn't see it that big of a problem. But I understand the guilt that he felt. You feel me? Yeah, definitely. And also, like, when he was in the van, he was texting Wesley, mm -hmm. saying, like, hey, like, I'm sorry I left you like that, but I just want to let you know I'm out of town. Mm -hmm. And then first he wrote, you should join us sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then he deleted that part and just said, like, I'm out of town. Mm -hmm. So it also made me feel like maybe he wants to do this alone or maybe he wants all the glory to himself. Yeah. And he's like just battling with that, with those feelings. I got you. I got you. Yeah, maybe he is. Maybe he is like, you know, feeling like these guys are like who I really need to be rocking with. And me, you know, say, inviting Wesley out, he's not going to fit in the clique. They invited me out here, right? Not them. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, speaking of uh, getting the glory, though, the real star of this movie, in my opinion, is my boy Mal. My boy Bransky, because when they are riding in the van and they're kicking like an old school freestyle, Bransky can actually go like the fat white boy can flow. Post diabetes Malone actually got some bars. I rock with him hard. He goes hard. Right. There was also a freestyle, too, when Nina started spitting. And I was like, okay, she can go. <laughs> actually, I'm gonna keep it a buck. I like soul. I like soul. But he's low key like the, the weakest rapper. Like the <laughs> the weakest rapper in the movie. <laughs> Got the least amount of bars. I don't know. Any comments about that? Yeah, I definitely loved Ma too. Because mm -hmm. he was like, he had this like lovey-dovey type of feeling to him, but then he could spit yeah. as well. So it was definitely like charming character. 
And I really liked him. And he also felt like a big brother to the group. Like he felt the most mature person with Nina as well, because Nina was sort of like trying to keep them in check all the time. And obviously like being their manager and stuff, you know, she was like the boss bitch. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. uh, I liked her vibe as well. And I I liked her like lyrics as well. For me, like, in terms of in the movie rapping, the weakest one was seven. No, you think so? <laughs> in the movie. Okay, that might be true. That might be true. I didn't even remember him spitting, like, rapping like that. But uh maybe, maybe. <laughs> but seven is an important character. We're going to jump on him real quick. But back to Nina, right? One thing that I thought was going to happen in this film was that there was going to be... Nina was going to be the love interest to somebody, Right? Or there was going to be a love triangle, or she was going to be like a snake to Soul. Because when Soul starts riding with these guys, Nina's like, you know, I got this record label in New York. They're interested in signing you. And I thought, okay, this is real, this is happening way too fast. And plus, you know, there's all these moments too when it's just Soul and Nina like sort of alone. And then Nina goes off with another character too. I thought there was going to be like some friction with who's going to get Nina's affection. Cause she's the only girl in this car full of guys. Were you thinking that? What, what did you think about Nina's vibe and character or anything? Yeah. I mean, obviously because she's the only girl character really in the movie, I was thinking like, okay, who's she fucking? Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, like then it's sort of like the vibes as the movie continued it looked like, you know, they had a true friendship plus business connection, but just like very, you know, family business type of vibe. And mm-hmm. yeah, I liked, I liked her like overall aura and I don't, she was like, you know, nobody's going to fuck with me. Nobody like, as long as I don't want it, nobody's like, you know, coming near these mm-hmm. titties <laughs> <laughs> basically like, and she, mm-hmm. she was looking good too. Like she was a beautiful, she's a beautiful woman. Right, right. She had the big hoop earrings that made it look like the TV was buffering. We only saw the side of her face, and I thought, oh, man, I got to restart the browser every <laughs> time she turned her head. But, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Nina actually turned out to be cool, right? Uh, another interesting thing is that in this film, there's a character called Froggy, who's played by Micro TDH, who actually is, like, kind of actually very famous from Latin America, like, he has, like, two million subscribers on YouTube, like, uh, a million plus uh, followers on Instagram, right? And he's, like, in the film, like, kind of barely. I feel like if his character was cut, uh, it wouldn't change that much in the story, right? But what did you think about Froggy, one of the other members of LIA in the bus? I thought he was cool. I thought he was present. I don't think, like, he was in that background too much. Yes, like the main characters were Sol, Mao, Nina, and Seven, mm-hmm. right? But then mm-hmm. after them, it was, I think, Froggy. And then Big Loco was even more in the background. And then Kai mm-hmm. was even more in the background. Right. So I think like he was somewhere in the middle and I liked his vibe. He had like the, you know, Latino star, uh, confidence, you know, bad bunny <laughs> <laughs> vibes a little bit. And right. it was like a, you know, good mix. And this group is a good mix right. as well because they got like, you know, the skinny white dude, the fat white dude, <laughs> and like a bunch of black dudes, Latina, like rapper slash singer, Latina right. girl, you know, everything's well, there. Right. I think this film, you know, because it doesn't talk about race at all in this film. Right. Which I think goes to show like how Gen Z this movie is too, as well. Uh, but I also have to keep in mind, this film was written and directed, I think, by an Asian American woman, if not a white woman. I forgot. The, do you know? Uh, yeah, Catherine Pro- Proper. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, she's like Asian American. Okay. All right. So there's a possibility that the, the race part of this film might have been skipped over, right? Because it wasn't written from the perspective of, uh, a black American or, or somebody who comes from that hip hop background as well, possibly, right? This is just a story rather than a hip hop story in the mind of the writer and the director. So that's one thing to keep in mind, but it is very Gen Z and that race doesn't come up, but I know for a fact, I know for a fact, if Lost Souls was a documentary, 
Seven and Mal would be saying the N word all throughout this film. It'd be like, yeah, soul, that's my nigga. Like, I know that for a fact, cause that's how the young boys talk. The young, the young generation, they be dropping the N bomb and it don't matter if they got blonde hair, blue eyes. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care. So that was, uh, one thing I was actually nervous about the film. Cause I was like, when is Seven gonna drop the N bomb? I know he has it on the tip of his tongue. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily agree with you on that. Talk to me. Because I thought like seven, especially seven, right? He was very like doing the black lingo and mm -hmm. it felt like he was adopted by black parents or something. <laughs> like that's how he talked. He was like, it felt like he was raised, you know, with all black people around him and no white people. Mm. And uh, I think someone in that generation being raised like that would respect what it is. Like, you know, what, what belongs to black people in terms of lingo. I think newer generation is more respectful. Hopefully, mm -hmm. like, hopefully I'm right, but I just mm -hmm. feel like that, that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got you. I got you. I think, uh, I think on one hand, if seven, you know, grew up all around black people, it depends on what type of black people he grew up around. Cause there's some black people that don't mind white people using the N word around them and stuff like that. Uh, and there are other black people who will get very offended. Right. And, uh, there is a scene actually where all the characters are sitting around the campfire and they tell their stories. And seven says that, you know, he grew up in Beverly Hills, but he was always misunderstood and the world was always trying to make him out to be the bad guy. But that's because he didn't want to sit in class and just listen to the teacher talk all day. Right. And, uh, yeah, Froggy tells his story too. And he got a bunch of issues. Soul tells his story. Everybody tells their story around the fire. Any comments about that? Um, yeah, it was nice to sort of like get to know the backgrounds of people mm. in the movie. And also like, I think that that bonding moment was like actually what was important for me in that scene because yeah, like with a lot of people, when you're young, you have fun and you're goofing around and all jokes and stuff. But then like there are sometimes those bonding moments with random people that, you know, you meet and then you actually realize that, you know, you have certain things in common or even though these people are like always laughing and confident and stuff like that, they might have like very, you know, hurtful pasts. Mm -hmm. And uh it just reminded me of like some conversations I had with random people that just like ended up in very deep places. And then mm -hmm. I ended up like, you know, finding out that they had very traumatic pasts. Right, and, right, uh, right. Yeah, it it reminded me of like the conversations I had. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you meet people and you're able to open up to them about everything more than you would your own family or close friends, right? And uh yeah, around the fire Basically, you know, Soul says, you know, he comes from that broken home and breaks it all down. And, uh, yeah, it, I felt like that was enough background we needed from all of the characters, right? Because once again, the film doesn't try to get too heavy on who everybody is and where they all came from. Cause it's about the moment that they're in. Cause I think at the campfire scene, Mao says something like, I just want to do this forever, chilling, smoking, making music, being with my friends. Cause that's what it is. That's what the film is about though. It's about this precious moment, this time in youth and the dreams that you have in your youth. You get what I'm saying? It's about capturing that vibe. Yeah, definitely. And mm -hmm. also before we continue, I want to like go back to the scene where they end up stopping at a farm mm -hmm. and they talk, they start talking to this like old farmer mm -hmm. and there are like buffaloes there, cows there, and they start playing with them. They trying to like feed them and stuff. Mm. And, um, yeah, for me, like also that scene, I was wondering after they showed the scene, like, why did they put this scene here? Mm. And they also have a conversation with the old man and they say like, you must be working, you know, really hard here, man. Like you're very mm. old and you did a good job. Sounds like a good life and all sorts of things. And I feel like that sort of represented the prejudice over you know the new generation especially when they're looking like how they're looking in the movie <laughs> you know they're wearing like all these crazy colorful outfits their hairs are like crazy and they talk like weird but 
you know, and most of the time when older people like see them, they think of them as like, oh, they're thugs, they're criminals, or they do bad stuff. Yeah. You know, these kids. But at that moment, it just felt like, you know, they were in their own like natural state and yeah, they were yeah. admiring the beauty of the nature of this man that was there and you know how they appreciate the life he live, lived lived yeah. cuz even though these these like young kids they want to become famous they want to have you know drugs and bitches and alcohol mm -hmm. they also can appreciate like a uh, serenity of a farm right like they're not devoid of you know feeling these more serene emotions mm -hmm. and uh i really like that scene as well yeah i just feel like with that scene it was just random as hell <laughs> i honestly feel like that scene could have been cut low-key I, i felt like it didn't really serve a purpose if they were trying to make a message about the youth meeting the old the 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 transient meeting the most stable lifestyle person if that was the message they were trying to send it, it's it kind of missed its mark and i didn't catch it but uh <laughs> that's like the one scene i really didn't like in this film <laughs> really honestly. i mean i like that film because i was thinking Why isn't this man like chasing them out with his gun from his property? Because honestly, I feel like if this was in Turkey, like they would be chased out, yeah, or they would get weird looks and stuff like that. So, hey. southern yeah. hospitality, they're just being nice, good old southern folk. Yeah, come and talk to me about the cows. <laughs> I guess, I guess. I mean, that's why I was like thinking, why is this scene here? Yeah. And then that's the conclusion I came up with. Yeah. But speaking of another conversation during the whole journey across Texas, like Seven gets a phone call from one of their former bandmates, I guess, who's now in prison. And uh, he's like, I miss y'all, bros. I miss y'all. Y'all be good out there. Y'all be strong. I can't wait to touch down. And then, uh, you know, he showed Seven shows the phone to soul and he says this is our new bandmate and then so i was like what's happening bro and the guy behind the prison wall was like what's good man <laughs> what did you think about that whole prison conversation yeah i thought it was weird because obviously seven talked to this man on the phone who was in prison mm -hmm. like he was his biological brother mm -hmm. right and uh it was obvious that you know he talked to him frequently And that he like missed him and, you know, there was that some emotional connection between them, definitely. Uh, and like, or a family connection. So once again, it was like, I was thinking, okay, like seven did grow up around like people mm -hmm. like this. And that's how like he is the way he is. Man, it could be two things. It could be seven grew up around people like that. Or he is the white boy bankrolling this whole entire operation. And they're just using seven. <laughs> you think so it could be that it could be that who knows who because knows? yeah like i i remember you saying throughout the movie because they'd be stopping at like you know a bunch of restaurants they ate whataburger yeah and the, like diners and stuff like that and they are like what seven eight people yeah so it's like who's paying for all of that yeah yeah this film in this film money is not an issue now it's not like they're balling out of control It's not like they got, you know, real diamonds and gold teeth and stuff like that. But, you know, they find a way to feed themselves, put gas in the van, and always sort of have food in their bellies and, and weed to smoke. You get what I'm saying? So there's yeah. some money in this thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and they also have, like, a camera, too. Like, I don't yeah. know if it's, like, something, you know, uh, very expensive, but... Yeah, it it does look like a mini production. Yeah. Mini tour bus. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think that that jail call, right, was once again really authentic to this film because there are so many rappers uh in the in the world who have somebody who's locked up, right? And also there are so many poor people in America who know somebody locked up. Like in America, I think it's like one in Every 20 people are in the prison system or something like that. They could be on probation, parole, or they've been arrested before, uh, been, been to jail, got out. You get what I'm saying? So everybody knows somebody in America who has had to deal with the criminal justice system. And especially if you're, you know, from the lower classes of America, you get what I'm saying? So it's like, that was very real to have that in the film, right? Because 
I'm pretty sure if we did a poll of most rappers, they would know somebody behind bars. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It did feel like it was reflecting reality. Yeah. And it also, like, I think that guy that they spoke as well, I think he was making music with them too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, like you said, I've seen it, like when we watched Diamonds in the Dirt mm -hmm. and stuff like that, like so many of those guys went into the prison system. Yeah, so many, so many. But uh speaking of like prison, <laughs> right, one way to go to prison is having drugs and guns. And so basically LIA stops at like this uh trailer park and they all sleep there one night and they're all like, man, we wish we had some weed. And then Soul is like, I got you. And he pulls out a big old jar of weed from his backpack and everybody's happy. But he also finds a gun in his backpack. And he's like, whoa, whoa, I didn't even know that was in there. And uh, yeah, that's Wesley's gun. And so basically, you know, moving on in the film, there's some tension that's brewing between Seven and Soul. And they sit right next to each other on the bus, right? And there's one scene when like Seven is starting to like pull on Soul's dreadlocks with like this clamp, this toy clamp. And uh yeah, basically they're making it to like El Paso, Texas. I don't know, there's somewhere out there deep in West Texas. And they're about to do a show. And uh, you know, Soul is really nervous before he gets on stage and they uh, you know, announce that Soul is their new member of the band and they basically rip up the show, right? They they tear they tear it down. And uh yeah, there's a the next day or something like that, somewhere later on, um, Soul and Seven and the guys, they're out shopping for shoes in some West Texas town, and Soul runs away with some shoes without paying for them, right? And uh, he runs around the corner, and he meets up with the guys, and he hands the shoes to Seven, and Seven says, I gotta do something right. So he takes these shoes that are brand new and gives them to a homeless person. And then they, then, you know, Seven and Soul get into a fight and they're recording this for like world star hip hop or Instagram to try to go viral and the police come and arrest them. What did you think about any of those scenes right there? Um, yeah, I thought like, uh, like the tension between Soul and Seven before, I thought it was just like their dynamic at first, mm -hmm. right? Because Seven is sort of like this annoying guy. Mm -hmm. And he is like this, um, you know, outlaw, trying to be an outlaw, trying to be a dangerous person, right? And then Soul is like not fucking with that because he is a black man in America. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, I want to do music and that's it. Like, I don't want to be like, you know, uh, in the prison or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I thought at first that was just their vibe. But with that scene, like how they sort of made him steal shoes from that. I was so annoyed at Seven, and it didn't make any sense. Definitely felt stupid, and that's like the downfall of this generation, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we do stupid shit for, like, social media, and it can, like, very much fuck us up. And then when they were at the, you know, in jail, basically, like, uh, in the police station, yeah. it's like... Uh, Seven got out first and then Soul was left there and I was just feeling very bad for him and also like thinking about how the system is as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that that part was like hella dumb, but that's hella real too because people be doing whatever for the clout for social media. Like I was actually shocked that while they, they were filming Seven and Soul fighting and the guys were like, yeah, man, that's going to go viral. Like, that was so dumb. Like, really dumb. Like, let's steal some shoes to go viral. Like, that is not a good look. But, um, yeah, I really like the performance scene. Like, all the performance scenes in this film are very dope whenever they're on stage. I really like that scene. What did you think? Yeah, definitely. The performance stage was really good. And also, uh, just like, you know, uh, extra information. While they're, like, having all this van trip, right, this tour in Texas, there are footages of Wesley uh, mm. that are being shown, and I thought that was Soul's, like, just memory, mm -hmm. or what he was feeling at those times, and remembering mm. his friend Wesley, and also feeling guilty as well, yeah. and there was a conversation where he um, Wesley's sister calls Soul, mm -hmm. and he has a FaceTime with her, and she says, like, 
um, Wesley is sleeping in the hospital. Wow. But he will wake up or Ooh. something like that. So they're like from there as well. And on from there, they showed more and more footages of Wesley, mm -hmm. especially when they were playing songs and stuff. And in the concert as well, uh, Soul thinks he saw Wesley. Mm -hmm. And then he sort of stops for a second. Mm -hmm. And then he continues like uh, singing his music and things like that. So yeah. it was very interesting. I thought it was very emotional as well. Yeah. But it also definitely made me feel like, you know, when you're up on that stage, uh, you know, you feel the glory, you feel like, I don't know, lighter and mm. more energetic and you feel like, you know, everyone likes you and, you know, mm -hmm. you're talented. Those are the th feelings you feel. And I was definitely relating to that. Yeah. Yeah. It made me think about like how in the music industry, they say like, whenever you get a big success, there's always like that major tragedy that comes with it. Right. Like, I don't know, who was it? Jennifer Hudson. Right. She won a Grammy one year. And then like the very next week, like her auntie and like brother died in a home invasion or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like anytime somebody gets something great, God takes something away from you, too. Right. Or you're haunted by your past uh, for unresolved things while you're becoming mega famous. So that was a cool scene. I forgot about that scene that you brought up. You know what I mean? Like uh, when Wesley was in the crowd, or at least when uh, Soul thought he saw Wesley in the crowd and all those images that he uh, had in his mind of Wesley, of them hanging out and Wesley making beats and being his biggest cheerleader, you know? Yeah. And I think that was like also one of the main conflicts that Soul was having, because I remember Nina saying like, you know, when Sol was down, Nina said something like, there's always stuff happening back at home. Mm. You know, she didn't ask what is happening back at home. But yeah. she was like, you know, everyone has some shit that is happening with their family. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's health and all things, you know. Mm -hmm. And like that. But on the other side, he has this, you know, um, addiction of, you know, feeling glorious, making music feeling young, feeling reckless as well. So I think he was like all the time conflicting with those two like moods. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah, he was, you know, he was trying to make it to LA. Like throughout this film, they're always rapping and freestyling like, yeah, we're going to make it to LA one day, bro. We're going to be driving down Maholland. We're going to be in Beverly Hills, Rodeo. But at the same time, he's, on the way to LA, but he's not there with the homie that he was always saying he was going to do it with. Right. And, um, that's like the big tragedy in this film or like this overcast of his like, uh, dreams coming real. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, throughout this movie, music is constantly in the background. And I like that in this film, one of the most memorable scenes is like all of them, LIA plus soul, being in the studio, working on this song uh, that goes, look into the sky, tell me what you see, why I'm feeling empty, whatever, whatever. Like that whole vibe in the studio when they were making that song, which is a real song called Loneliness, where all of the real rappers make it. I think it's, uh, uh, who is it? It's uh, Soul, Crystal Poppin, and it's also uh, uh, Micro TDH. Like, that's actually a really good song. What did you think about that scene, like that studio scene for Loneliness? Uh, like, the whole of this movie, it was a vibe. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I loved to see that, like, creative process of, mm. you know, songwriting and, you know, just forming the song, making the lyrics and stuff like that. Because that's something I always admired. Yeah. Um. Because, yeah, like in high school and stuff, I was singing, I was in, in the band, but I never wrote any songs or anything like that. But I definitely was jealous of people who were able to do that, mm -hmm. like a good jealous. Mm -hmm. And uh like you can do that. And I'm jealous of you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah. And I always wondered, like, how do people come up with with like super dope lyrics? Mm -hmm. and it was like really cool and it sort of made it seem like you know it's simple just go with the vibe just go with mm -hmm. the feeling whatever you're like thinking in that moment just say it yeah and it just inspired me i can say 
Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I have to say this though. When they made that song Loneliness, and by the way, they made it over Wesley's beats because, uh, Soul said to Mal, hey, my homie made this beat, and Mal was like, that's fire, right? And so I, it was cool how it went full circle. Uh, and they didn't, I thought this film was going to turn out to be like a snake story, like LIA was going to steal this beat, it was going to become a hit, kick Soul out of the group and all that sort of stuff, but that didn't happen, right? So it was cool to see that Wesley was still able to be a part of Soul's st story and journey. But I have to say, before they made that song, Mal was freestyling over a beat before that, and he was killing it. I swear to God that <laughs> Mal is a dog. Bransky is a dog. Like, he is a star for real, for real. Like, somebody sign him. Sign him. Get that white boy in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> it's Braxny. 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 Who gives a fuck? Sign him. <laughs> yeah, he was, he did have, like, the best lyrics. Yeah. And the best lines uh, when they were like singing and stuff. Yeah, he was definitely. It. Yeah, he and he had it. a nice voice too. Yeah, yeah, he could sing, he could rap, uh, he could probably cook hella good uh, ribs on the grill. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, yeah, what else? What else is happening in this film? So, so yeah, I guess we'll, yeah. Uh, you want to pick it up? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to pick it up from, like, the performance. Yeah. So, yeah, they they go to El Paso and they perform there. And then after the performance, it's, like, Mao's birthday as well. And they're having, like, this after party by the beach or not by the beach. I don't know where it is. Mm. Uh, but it's, like, this, you know, empty space, basically. And they have a bonfire and everyone's drinking, everyone's vibing and stuff like that. And then... Um, I think there, uh, like some of the guys are trying to hit on girls and seven is, um, secretly taking pills from soul's backpack. Mm. And I think he took it when they were in the studio mm. and then he's been like popping the pills since then. And then at that time he takes a lot of them and then he just kind of goes like crazy and he sets the car on fire. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, this is happening. Soul is like on his phone and he's looking at like his videos on Instagram. But then he goes into Wesley's Instagram and then finds a, a recent photo of him. And then everybody he's looking at the comments and everybody's saying RIP. He's gone too young. Nobody expected this. And then he's mm -hmm. going through the comments and there's like a comment saying that uh, Soul is a cop out or something like that. Like, um, you know, he left Wesley or something like that. And yeah, he's basically he's a sellout. Yeah, sellout. And, uh, yeah. And then he's, there's like this footage of Wesley, like doing all sorts of dumb stuff that they did together. And, you know, basically just remembering Wesley, uh, from his past. And then he realizes that, um, seven, lit the car on fire <laughs> so he goes there and says like what the hell are you doing mm -hmm. and uh yeah they that basically like the car explodes and they stop the party i guess <laughs> yeah. like we don't see the rest of the party of what mm -hmm. happened but yeah they, there's like some tension there but what did you think about that scene yeah when wesley died i didn't expect that in the film i didn't know where it was going and uh it was kind of sad it was really sad and uh i think you know, Wesley's death sort of is symbolic of like L Juice World's death or, um, Lil Loaded's death or so many other like young SoundCloud-ish rappers that were so close, but then they, you know, lost their life to tragedy, whether it be drug overdoses or gun violence or something like that. You get what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, it was just really moving. It was really moving. To, uh, for Wesley to die. And, uh, you know, Seven blowing up the car, right, it sort of, like, brought Soul back to the reality that, damn, I sort of gave up being with my best friend and being there for him in this time of need to be with these people who might be a bit reckless, too. And they're living that sort of lifestyle that could get them in the same situation my friend is in. So it sort of all came full circle, and it showed, like, the pain that Soul was going through. Any comments? Yeah, uh, I saw like something was gonna 
something bad was going to happen to Wesley and possibly he might have been dead. I saw that coming because, yeah, like when his little sister said he was in the hospital, I was thinking like, yeah, I don't think this is going to end well. I thought it was going to be something like Wesley was going to be like, you left me, bro. I was almost about to die. And he confronts Soul when Soul is about to have like his major break. And then there's that confrontation. Yeah, no. I, like from the time that he left them there uh, in the party, I felt something bad was going to happen. Possibly mm. it could have been death. And then it turned out like that. Um, but it was definitely still like heartbreaking. And mm -hmm. it was also heartbreaking that Soul really didn't tell anybody. Because yeah. I was thinking, like, why isn't he, like, saying, yo, like, my friend died. Yeah, my best yeah, friend yeah. died. And possibly the reason he didn't say it because he was feeling guilty. Right. But it's also that thing that Nina said, right? Like, we all got issues back home. So if nobody else in the car is talking about their problems, right? And this is still, even though they're young artists, right? They're still men, right? And men don't talk about their feelings. Men don't want people to feel sorry for them. You get what I'm saying? So maybe yeah. that's why he didn't tell them. Yeah, but it was still sad because it did seem like they were getting closer and closer every day. Yeah. Like even though they probably known each other for a couple of days, right? Mm -hmm. uh, still, I feel like you know, he should have said something and then they would have supported him because Loki, like all these guys were like really nice yeah. to each other most of the time. Like even Seven, mm -hmm. he had like those moments where he would encourage Saul, mm -hmm. like right before and after the concert and things like that. And he mm -hmm. would say like some poetic shit. Yeah. So like, yeah, they weren't like heartless people. Right. So I wish he said something, but yeah. Yeah, so speaking of that, basically the next day, you know, Soul wakes up in the van, kind of pissed off because, like, Mao is, like, messing with him, knocking his hat off, saying, wake up, you know, and uh he asks Nina where they are, and Nina says that they're going to L.A., and, uh, you know, Nina is like, uh, you know, this record label is interested in you, maybe they can get you signed, and he's like, yeah, whatever, and then... You know, him and Nina start going back and forth. And then also Soul starts going back and forth with uh, Kai uh, in the back seat because Kai is like, why are you being ungrateful? You get free studio time. And Soul is like, I don't give a fuck. And then Nina's like, you don't give a fuck? Well, get the fuck out of my car. And so then uh, he's like, yeah, all right, I'll get out my car. But where's my bag? And then he looks at Seven. Seven's still like asleep uh, in the back seat. And he's like, Seven, where's my bag of drugs? Uh and then he finds his bag, but he can't find his drugs inside. So he's like, Seven, where's my drugs? Seven, where's my drugs? And then everybody in the car is yelling at Soul, like, get out, get out, you know? And then they he pulls out his gun on all of them, and they're like, whoa, 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 chill, chill, chill. <laughs> and then they try to wake up Seven, and Seven is dead in the back seat too. And then there's this uh interesting flashback. You know, at, when everybody freaks out and everybody says, you know, hey, let's get Seven to the hospital, everybody be calm. There's a flashback or this hazy image that uh Soul has where he's hanging out with Wesley in the studio in L.A. and also hanging out with Seven in L.A. as well. So what did you think of those scenes? Yeah, it was uh it was a lot. Because it also felt like Soul said something like, you know, you got me on probation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it felt like he didn't want to be just another, you know, statistic. He didn't want to go to jail. And he was, like, very scared of that. And uh, I think he was very disappointed in himself and also in, you know, his friends or, like, those people that he was hanging out with that they put him in this situation. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, but then he was also going through grief and mm. yeah, like, and then Nina came off like super hardcore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was scared. Like I thought she was going to slap someone. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also got scared when soul pulled out the gun because I was like, Oh my God, no, this is America. I know guns get out and somebody gets shot. Please don't mm -hmm. shoot anyone. I don't want anyone to die. Mm -hmm. But just as I was thinking that it's like seven is dead. Yeah. And then Seven and Wesley is like just chilling in heaven, <laughs> listening to rap, making music in the studio yeah. in heaven. 
mm-hmm. just like hanging out. But that was, I think, like a cool footage that they showed. Yeah. After that happened. Yeah, I think you know one of the biggest issues for the younger generation that my generation didn't have is drug overdoses, and uh, it's interesting that in this film two of the characters die from drugs. Uh, you know, my generation, our issues were like homicides, right? Uh, and the generation before that, it was homicides. But this generation is not the drug sellers. They're not gangsters. They're drug users. You get what I'm saying? This is like one of the biggest critiques of the SoundCloud era. But this film really humanizes it to make it more sort of like understandable. Like, yeah, they're reckless drug users, but they're not like you know, wild addicts, I would say. You get what I'm saying? Because, like, my generation had wild addicts. They were, like, you know, smoking a ton of weed, getting hella drunk, drinking lean and stuff like that. But uh this new generation, you know, everything's laced with fentanyl. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you can die just from accidentally taking a dab of fentanyl. So it's, like, it's interesting, like, this film makes so many parallels between the stories of, like, Mac Miller, Lil Peep, how Eminem almost died from a drug overdose. And um, yeah, th- when they have that flashback scene or hazy dream scene of, uh, yes. of Soul, Wesley and, and uh, Seven in LA, it's sort of like, damn, like this is what Juice World or Mac Miller or Lil Peep would be doing if they were still alive. And as Soul, as the protagonist, he's like us imagining being in the studio with them. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was definitely heartbreaking. To sort of see what could have been, uh, like the, you know, the dream of soul, mm-hmm. uh, at that point. And I do agree with you. Like, I think, like, I guess older generation, they also had, like, they had crack, yeah. but I don't think crack was that involved in hip hop scene. I mean, we, it was crack selling. There was nobody rapping about, Hey, I'm smoking crack. <laughs> Everybody was <laughs> selling crack. But the kids today, they're like, we are smoking crack, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're taking everything. Yeah. And it is sort of like a proud point, you know. They yeah. are singing about it, like, and then sort of, like, proud of it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, basically, after Seven's death, uh, Soul leaves the band. Nina s- tells him, like, good luck. Uh, and Soul sort of heads back to uh, Austin. Austin, Texas, where he's from, and uh, he's, you know, trying to get his ish back together. He, he undyes his hair so he's back to his natural color. He's, like, hanging out with homeless people, getting, you know, food from the homeless shelter, and a homeless man tries to give him some encouragement to, like, get back in the studio, get back in the booth. He goes back to Wesley's mom's house, and uh, she welcomes him back. So does uh, Wesley's sister, because she always loved him, too. And, uh, yeah, basically, uh, Soul and Wesley's mom have, like, a really close heart-to-heart moment, you know, where she says, you know, you're always welcome here. You're like a son to me and stuff like that. And, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, Soul, you know, commemorates Wesley's memory by going skating and tagging a wall with Wesley's name. And then he, like, uh, gets a uh, job at a shoe, sh- at a shoe store, ironically. Right. And and it looks like he's the manager because he's like training people. And uh, the film ends basically with this last scene of Soul back with his colored hair in a more fancy studio rapping and and singing a new song. And Mal is behind the boards making the song. And Mal says, this guy, we used to hang out with him a lot. And uh, he's always been cool. And. You know, we think he's got talent, right? And it looks like it's actually more official at the end. And uh, the movie ends with, you know, Mal and Soul freestyling in the booth and then fades to black, really. Uh, What did you think about, you know, those final scenes? Yeah, I didn't expect, you know, Soul to go back to his hometown. Mm -hmm. And, like, him going back, it was sort of like, for me, him facing the truth. Mm -hmm. And, like, facing his regrets, his mistakes, and sort of just accepting certain things in life. Because the conversation, the last conversation he has with Nina is basically Nina tells him, like, you know, we all have, you know, dreams about music, but it ain't worth dying for. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And then Soul says, what is worth dying for then, if not music? Mm -hmm. And then she says, I don't know, but, like, if you find it, don't let go. Something like that. And, uh, yeah, maybe he realizes, he realized that, you know, music without, like, Wesley or without, you know, people like Wesley in his life maybe doesn't make sense. I don't know. Like, I don't know what he realized. Uh, maybe he just gave up on his dreams mm-hmm. and decided to like go back to reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe he grew up, become a man. Uh, but it was sort of sad seeing him leave, you know, uh, right. like his dream. I, I think this film is amazing at showing a truer story of the struggle rapper because in eight mile embodied in rap shit on HBO, in Hustle and Flow, and almost every single hip-hop come-up story movie, the main character at the end either gets the record deal or gets a big hit or is about to be famous and successful. Like, there's victory. But in this one, it's defeat. And that hit home for me, like, so much. It's so hard to even describe because I was actually on the verge of tears. I didn't tell you this. Because that was so real for me. Like, you have to realize your rap dreams will not come true, nigga. You will not be Dr. Dre. You won't be Snoop. You're not going to make it. 99% of us don't make it. And (laughs) technically, even the people in this film didn't make it. (laughs) Even the actual rappers in this film didn't make it. So that shows, like, how hard this game is. You get what I'm saying? And, uh, man, that was so real to see, like, Soul working in a shoe store and sort of, like, crouched over, realizing that, you know, he's not going to be a superstar, like how the film began. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was, it was so real. It was too real. It was too real. I, it's a bit cringy for me even to even say this or watch it sometimes, watch it at certain points because it, it's too authentic. It's mm. too real. Do you do you remember like the moment you realized that your dream was not gonna come true? Hell yes. Hell Tell yes. Tell us. Uh there were there were quite a few times. <laughs> and uh <laughs> basically I just realized it wasn't gonna come true when um I did a concert in Miami and by concert it was like an open mic, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I was like rapping my heart out. And I know everybody goes through this. Like, you could be a stand-up comedian, a rapper, whatever. Hell, Kanye West did, like, Jesus Walks before he blew up, and people were just looking at him crazy, not realizing that was, like, the song of a generation, right? But, yeah, I just basically did this open mic in Miami, and, like, nobody cared. Like, I was rapping about suicide, killing myself, uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. I had uh, dance songs, party songs, sad songs, all sorts of shit in my set list, and nobody cared. And I just felt like, all right, this... This is not for me. It's not going to work. If I just did all that, I gave it my all and it's not working now. Yeah. And of course, there was more buildup than that. There was like, the when I found out that these rappers, like the big rappers, all have ghostwriters too. That's what made me say, oh, no, that's not real. It's not real. It's all steroids. You get what I mean? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like very sad you know people giving up on their dreams like how we see in this movie and Mm -hmm. also like hearing you speak as well because i love you and i think you're great but yeah it doesn't also mean that just because that dream didn't work like life isn't working either you know you do find other joys and other passions in life and like look at you you did find other passion you're a struggling youtuber now (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but hopefully you know that will get bigger. Yeah. And yeah, like the end. Ah, uh, the end. I don't know. I felt like it was a memory. Mm. But then like when we talked about the very end, talking about like Mao and Soul in the studio together. And then talking with you, you said like, I thought like it's what could have been. Mm. Um. But then I also heard like the words Brackney in the, in the song that they were saying. Mm. So then I felt like, is it like a back scene footage? Mm. So I don't know what it is. I'm confused by it. Right. I feel like that scene was a dream. Some people might say that's, you know, stock footage or like a blooper or whatever. 
Some people might feel like that's the future. Like uh, Soul got back in the booth and he's making hits now with uh, Mal, who's a producer or something. And it's possible that Mal's real name could have been Brackney, right? So, uh, yeah, like as in in the film, like Mal's character, his real name could have been Brackney too, right? Because Seven, the character, his artist name in real life is Seven too. So there might have been that blurring, right? Who knows? Yeah. But yeah. Um, I just feel like the way it looks and the way it's shot and the way it feels, it doesn't feel like that's real or possible. Especially after everything that happened with Soul, like pulling a gun out on Mal in the in the in the in the truck, and uh, them parting ways in L.A., you know, it didn't seem real. It almost seemed too perfect. Plus, Soul had his hair dyed again. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, and at the end of the film, when he's like hugging Wesley's mom and Jesse, his hair is like normal. So it felt like this was what he wanted things to be. But it's not how it is. And mm. it's very actually kind of sad. Even though the movie has a happy ending, it has a sad ending. Low key, in my opinion. Yeah, I don't know if it's a happy ending. Uh, it's definitely like um, kind of heartbreaking. Because it's also like now that Soul is back, yes, he faces demons. He faces regrets. And he's sort of like going through his karma, right? Like working at the sneaker shop having to, like, have hard conversations and, you know, having to look at Wesley's sister's face every single day and also his mm -hmm. mom's face every single day, mm -hmm. knowing that he sort of, like, left him there, mm -hmm. right? He has to, you know, live through all of that, but he doesn't have, like, Wesley there anymore. And he is going through pain as well. He's going through grief. So it was definitely, like, I thought, for me, it was a sad ending. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, uh, you know, this film is very ambiguous, right? Because somebody else could look at that and say, well, look at that. He actually still followed his dream and he still has his friends. Maybe, maybe. But uh, I don't know. I kind of disagree with that. I disagree. I think uh, it's almost too perfect how it ends, right? Because most of us won't become the big mega rappers. It won't happen. Right. And uh, all soul can do now is dream on what could have been. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, that's my opinion. That's my opinion on that. But it's still a very, very, very good film. I want to give a shout out once again to all of the uh, uh, rappers, actors here, because it's uh, very moving, very moving. And it's a very unique uh, hip hop film. And um, the thing that I just want to say before we wrap this up is like the ending and this film in general reminds me of this um this description of the music industry, and I forgot who said it, but it goes like this. Imagine there was a dragon, and everybody, everybody lines up to get eaten by this dragon. Because when they're inside their dragon, they have the best party imaginable. There's girls, there's coke, there's, there's gold, there's swimming pools, there's mansions. You're inside the dragon, but you're only in it for a short time. And then when you have to exit the dragon, it's the most disgusting, nasty thing that you ever do. And so then every day people get eaten up by the dragon and then shat out. And as soon as they're, you know, out of the shit pit, they crawl back into the front of the line to get eaten up by the dragon again. And that's like what the music industry is. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just made me think about what the, uh, like how that feeling of the film is, right? Like soul lost kind of everything a little bit to his pursuit for music. And he still kind of wants to do it. <laughs> you, st you still want to do this? You get what I'm saying? So, yeah, that's just all I got to say. Any comments? Yeah. I mean, like, you saying this and you knowing what music industry is like, like, if you were given a chance to be famous, to be a famous rapper, like, would you still take it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's how sick it is. That's how sick it is. Yes. <laughs> I had I had to seriously think about it, but yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I mean, if I was in your shoes, I would say yes too. Because it's sort of like the glorification of it, right? Because yeah. as much as there are bad sides to it, there are good sides to it and also like you get to share your, mm. you know, passion and mind with other people all around yeah. the world.
Yeah. And maybe that's worth, you know, that sort of glorification of yourself is worth all the trouble. Yeah. I guess for mm-hmm. some. Um, First time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, overall, really like this film. I give this actually a nine. A nine. Mm. It's worth a nine for me. What about for you? Um, yeah, I really like this movie. I think it is a great coming of age movie and also great music movie. Uh, I'll give it, uh, an 8.5. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suggest people watch it, uh, really suggest hip hop fans watch it, really suggest people looking for a good Gen Z film. Uh, if you're looking for a film to, you know, make yourself feel old to watch people born in 2006 prance around on screen, this will do it for you. <laughs> this will do it for you. You will feel old after this. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, this film will become a cult classic. And have more people talking about it in the future, right? As it builds steam. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think this is underrated right now. Yeah. But uh, that's it. That's all I got to say. Y'all be easy out there. And, uh, yeah, this has been episode 68 of Simon and Acti Movie Reviews. If you have any you want us to check out, put it in the comments. Suggest it. And uh, anything else, Acti? No, I'm good. All right. Peace.